but obviously this will be recorded as well so people can check uh, back later for the beginning. Uh, hey, welcome to this month's uh, Drought and Climate Outlook as part of the Pacific Northwest uh, Drought Early Warning System. Uh, my name is John Stevenson. I work with the Climate Impacts Research Consortium uh, covering for Kathy Della, who is out on vacation um, this week. Um, Amanda, do you mind going to the next slide here? I just want to do a, a quick overview and then I'm going to hand it over to Amanda to give you a little bit of background on the dues, that drought early warning system, and then we'll go into uh, our speakers. Uh, our first uh, speaker will be Nick Bond with the Washington State Climate Office, uh, giving us an update on current uh, climate conditions. Catherine Roden from North, uh, the North, <clears throat> excuse me, the National Weather Office uh, in Spokane. We'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the kind of the immediate outlook the next uh, really month plus uh, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to the the climate hub um, and hear from gabrielle uh, rosh mcnally to hear an update on what they have going and, and i believe uh, she'll be handing on wolves uh to talk about a little bit about uh, research they've been doing on mega fires um, and a couple of uh, housekeeping notes uh, phil moat was supposed to be joining us uh, and talk about some of his work and others have been doing on snow trends in uh, the west and uh, unfortunately for us, fortunately for him, that uh, work was just accepted by nature and has been embargoed. So we're actually not going to hear about it today, but we're hoping that we can uh, hold his feet to the fire into the future and uh, come back and talk to us about that work. Uh, in terms of questions, what I would ask is that uh, each speaker will have about 10 minutes. If you have a question for them, go ahead and type, type that into your chat box. Uh, we'll try to take one uh, written question after each speaker finishes. Uh, if you have other questions, please feel free to continue typing them in and we'll revisit them at the end of um, all of the speakers. And with that, I think we'll just go ahead and uh, get started and uh, off to you, Amanda, give us a little background. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, as you said, my name is Amanda Sheffield and I'm down at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Uh, but I'm one of the newer regional drought information coordinators for NIDAS, which is the National Integrated Drought Information System. And I specifically work with California and Nevada, but in the meantime, while we're still getting a new coordinator for the Pacific Northwest, I've been helping with these webinars. Uh, so what is NIDAS? Um, just to give a little background for those of you that may have not joined us before, uh, NIDAS provides a better understanding of how and why drought affects society, the economy, and the environment. And we do this to, to improve accessibility, dissemination and use of early warning information um, for drought risk management. And although we're working towards a national drought early warning system, we realize there's regional drought, um, very specific impacts and information needs in different regions. So we have a bunch of different regional drought early warning systems um, that we have launched in the region. Um, these drought early warning systems work with the communities and then that local expert network uh, to build capacity for better decision making, thinking about observations and monitoring, predictions and forecasting, planning and preparedness, communication and outreach, and interdisciplinary research and applications. And what this looks like a lot of times is drought, uh, drought and risk assessments, drought and climate outlook forums or webinars like is this, engaging the preparedness communities, uh, building capacity around existing products as well as test bedding those new products, and developing new and existing and utilizing existing communication networks. Uh, the Pacific Northwest use was officially launched in February of 2016, and since then we've been working on strategic plans for each of the drought early warning systems, including the Pacific Northwest. And if it's not available up yet, it will be soon on drought.gov, will be our strategic for the Pacific Northwest strategic plan. It provides a roadmap um, for moving forward the dues, and as well as identifying existing and new drought related activities in the region. It's meant to be a living document, so it's not a stand-all document, but it's going to have a two-year time frame, and it will be updated periodically with new priority areas or priority activities along the way. Um, with that, I can go ahead and pass it on to the next speaker, um, which will be Nick, or John, if you want to introduce Nick real quick again. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, Nick, uh your own slides do you want to do you want to run it yourself or would you like us to yeah i i think uh having amanda run it would be fine and right, um like right up there yeah and so i'll just kind of blast in here um this first photograph um summarizes one aspect of the summer that will be remembered quite a while right of course the eclipse and notice how dry the landscape is 
to look in there and more about that in a minute. Uh, next slide. Um, another thing that we're going to remember about this summer is smoke and especially in the the populated regions west of the Cascades. Uh, this is a MODIS image from um, earlier this month during a, a heat wave in the Pacific Northwest and uh, um, BC was the source of this smoke. Uh, we're getting some in western Washington again uh, from a fire in eastern Washington right now, but that's um, it's been kind of remarkable how much we've had. So next slide. Um, I'd just like to start off with the, the most recent drought monitor for the west and uh, what immediately comes to eye there is the D4 and um, D3 in the eastern part of Montana that isn't uh, technically the northwest, I guess. But you can see Montana is the place that's really uh, being impacted the most here of the kind of western states. There has been the emergence of some DO regions in basically much of um, Washington and Oregon. and uh, and that's related to this um, uh, remarkably warm and dry summer that we've been ha having. And uh, it would, uh, I'm sure it'd be even worse if we hadn't had such a, a wet and snowy winter. So next slide. Uh, with regards to the dryness, um, this is of course a dry time of year anyway, but the um, how dry it, it's been has been remarkable with um, some places basically no rain in the last couple of months. Here this slide is the percent of normal precipitation um, from the end of June into last week and can see some lots of places less than 5% of the normal precipitation. Next one. Um, similar sort of look at temperature across the uh, uh, northwest, where much of the region, um, especially Washington, Oregon, is um, greater than two degrees Fahrenheit above normal, with some patches four and even higher uh, degrees above normal, uh, again, for the last couple of months. Um, the northern Rockies, not quite as hot. If we uh, go to the next slide, um, uh, comparing that with the uh, kind of remarkable summer of 2015, actually when you, it's a different scale and all that, but the temperatures in July and August in 2015 weren't actually that much different than they have been this this year. What was really noteworthy in 2015 was just how hot it was in June. And uh, June 2017 doesn't compare to June um 2015. So, in um, in some sense, it hasn't been as bad as um, as it was a couple of years ago. Okay, next slide. Um, just a, kind of a different perspective there. Just looking at the day-to-day -day, uh, temperatures here. I use Portland, Oregon, and uh, you can see that there it's from basically the start of July through the middle of last week. See a lot of days above normal, of course, with a couple of uh, records for the day set. The minimum temperatures mostly above normal, but hovering near the uh, normal range. Uh, and they, similar slides for Seattle show that almost every day the minimum temperatures were above normal. So we're, we're definitely seeing that in Washington State where our summer minimum temperatures are consistently above normal. All right, next slide. Why was it so warm and dry? Well, it was, uh, we had a big old fat ridge sitting over us aloft. Uh, this is um, a 500 millibar anomaly map, um, a geopotential height anomaly map for the, the same period of those temperature and precip maps that I showed. Uh, again, the reds uh, showing much higher heights than normal uh, over the Pacific Northwest. If uh, If you, isolate a box, basically a five by five degree box at the mouth of the Columbia River as shown in the next slide. And look at the time series of that for July and August uh, combined going back um, the basic INSEP reanalysis to the 1950 can see in the last few decades, of course, an upward trend there. And just for that region right at the mouth of the Columbia, it looks like this last couple of months are 
um, record high heights. And so, again, that ridge has um, just meant uh, that much more sinking motion and um, um, well, made us uh, hot and dry. So, next slide, please. Um, uh, stream flows. This is a map from uh, the middle of last week showing in uh, from a percentile point of view what the stream flows were uh, across the Pacific Northwest with the greens being basically in the normal range. See a lot of greens there, a few blues that were uh, above normal, a few reds much below normal, but uh, the stream flows have been kind of hanging tough at least on the medium sized rivers. Uh, presumably because it was such a wet and a winter and snow in, in the mountains. I don't know how much this kind of near normal uh, flows ha has to do with uh, the groundwater being, you know, fully charged and how much is just due to it. We're not, we normally don't get much rain in the summertime, but um, at least at any rate for most of the rivers in pretty good shape. Next slide. I uh, want to get back to smoke, and here this is a time series for a Seattle station, a PM 2.5, showing it during the heat wave at the end of July into August, uh, periods of elevated PM 2.5 concentrations. When you get above 80 or so, it gets pretty bad, and you can see that um, uh, that little dip in the middle there, the smoke was more aloft. So we thought this was pretty bad, but if you go to the next slide, um, I repeat that same trace on the bottom there in purple, and then uh, a site, Wenatchee, on the east side of the uh, Washington Cascade, showing that there is really bad with uh, one day getting into the 300 micrograms per meter cube, which is just um, nuts in terms of how much, and you can see for days on end, there was very elevated concentrations there. All right, next slide. Just a couple more to go. Um, uh, knowing me, I, I can't, um, I gotta have an SST anomaly map in there. And this shows for the, well, the whole world's oceans uh, as of last week that a little bit cooler than normal in the tropical Pacific, perhaps Catherine's gonna be talking about this. Virtually all of the North Pacific is Um, that has um, brought cooler water from depths um, along the coast. And so while most of the North Pacific is warm, it has been um, uh, cool there. And uh, I'm not sure of all the consequences there, but it um, could be, uh, could have some impacts on the ecosystem in terms of bringing up low oxygen water for the crab and rockfish and so forth. And so if if we could get the next, ah, there's the slide. So the, this shows the daily winds and the oceanographic condition um, convention there at Newport, Oregon, showing with a couple of minor interruptions. They've been mostly from the north uh, along the Oregon coast. And with that, um, I'll close. And I, I guess uh, if there are any questions, can uh, maybe take one right now, but uh, at the end, I think we're going to um, mostly have our discussion. Thank you. That sounds great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, and I don't see any questions in the question box at the moment, uh, but for those of you who came on a little bit after my introduction, uh, we're going to try to take one question after each uh, presentation. If, they, if you have them, uh, please just type them into the question box 
and I'll go ahead and just take the first one off of that. Um, and with that, um, on to you, Catherine. Hey, hi, I'm Catherine Rowden. I'm the hydrologist for the National Weather Service out of Spokane. Um, not a meteorologist or climate scientist, so just want to put that out there. Um, so going to go over the near-term outlook, long-range outlook, um, what we're looking at for the ENSO predictions for the winter, and a little bit of an anecdote that we've been looking at. So to start with, um, it's hot. We all know that. And Monday's high temp forecast, this is the, the forecast for today. I pulled it yesterday, so it might be slightly altered now. But there are the normal temps that we would expect for today. So anywhere from 8 to 16 degrees above average for where we're sitting right now for temperatures. And for the 6 to 10 day outlook, um, we are expecting some cooling this week, but then warming back up. And um, the, the climate outlooks have this above average temperature trend continuing. 80% um, chance of uh, above average temperatures continuing um, along the, the west coast into Washington, Idaho. Um, and then for the precip, that dry signal, oops, sorry, the dry signal is still continuing with the, the biggest odds of below average precip bullseye over eastern Montana, which is not great for them in their drought condition right now. Um, and then the seven day precip forecast. Uh, just to show what we've been seeing, um, zero for Seattle, Spokane, Portland, um, greater chances of some precip over Montana and Idaho, but on the order of maybe a hundredth to a tenth. Um, and Seattle did, I believe, set its record for days without measurable precip this summer, and Spokane is still going towards their record. I think right now we're at 60 plus days without measurable precip, and our record is 73 set in 1917, I believe, so could still be breaking more of those records this summer. And then beyond the 6 to 10 day outlook, um, it's pretty similar again. So uh, the bullseye now for the above average temps, still mostly Oregon, Washington, Idaho, uh, that below average precip odds now extends through the Pacific Northwest. And then looking out even further for the whole month of September, not a lot of difference here again. Um, still increased odds of above average temperatures. This time the bullseye is over eastern Washington, northwest Montana, and Idaho. So it just kind of keeps going and going and going. So for the three month outlook, uh, September, October, November, I'm kind of becoming a broken record, but it continues on. Um, increased odds through November. And I'm just going to go through these three month outlooks through the winter one by one. So the one you're seeing is September through November, and then October through December, November through January looks the same, looks the same, uh, December through February, January through March, February through April, and to save you the suspense, these look the same all the way through, I think, November of 2018. So what all the models are suggesting right now and all their number crunching is that we have increased odds of above average temperatures through 2018. So for the precip, however, um, here's the three months, September through November precip outlook. There's no signal right now over the Pacific Northwest, so it's equal chances right now of above, below, or at average precip. So, and I only put one slide in here because that's also the same. Um, at least through next spring, there's really no signal one way or the other for the precipitation. Um, for the winter for ENSO, um, right now, this is the, the bar chart the probabilistic forecast, those green bars are the probability of neutral. Um, and in that black box are kind of October through March, kind of our winter period. Um, blue is chances of La Nina, red is chances of El Nino. So right now, definitely neutral is dominating for what, what we might be looking at for the winter. Um, greater than a 50% chance right now we'll have a neutral winter. And sorry, this is the early August forecast. I forgot to mention that. Um, and then this is the mid-August forecast. trending pretty in line with what the last forecast was, so it's a good chance of neutral winter. That's the edge of a El Nino or La Nina, big strong event. They're all kind of hug in the middle, which is, again, suggests it's pretty good chance of neutral. And I'm glad Nick showed that uh, FST plot because I'm not showing it. So thanks for doing that, Nick. Um, and so just for those that are interested, here's the composite temp and precip 
from past neutral winters since 1980. Um, so temperature, um, actually in the Pacific Northwest, it tends to be cooler than average, which is completely opposite of what I just showed you for the outlook. And for precip, um, there's some variability, but for a wide area, it has tended to be above average precip. Um, but I'll show you why there is some chance for above average temps besides, you know, the other factors that go in besides so There have been a lot of neutral winters um, in these black boxes since the 80s that have been um, somewhere above average temps in the Pacific Northwest. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. And then as a hydrologist, I'm always interested in what that means for water um, in the winter, flooding, drought in the summer, et cetera. And this is the chart some of you probably are used to seeing from the Northwest River Forecast Center that shows the April through September runoff volume, which is usually the critical period for water that we're all worried about. So um, on the left-hand side, this is volume, and I just grabbed the uh, Clark Fork at Cabinet Gorge Dam, which is part of the Pondre River system. It drains off the Western Rocky Mountains in Montana. And then the the volumes are separated into the ENSO category. So on the left, you have La Nina, the middle, neutral, the right, El Nino. And then those little dots are the years. So like right up at the top, 1997 was a neutral year, and it was their highest volume on record for that location. So this trend shows La Nina winters definitely tend to have more water, El Nino less, or the, sorry, the summer following these winters. And the thing with neutral that we've seen is there just tends to be more variability, but uh, certainly the trend for the likelihood of having a very low water year after a neutral winter in most basins is less than if we were coming out of an El Nino winter. And I, I, I checked a few spots. I'm definitely more familiar with the inland northwest kind of watersheds, but I did check some other spots, you know, on the coastal basins and it's similar trends across the area that I saw. Um, and then just because it's been an interesting summer and we had an interesting summer a couple of summers ago, I just wanted to throw this out here. So I looked at the Spokane station um, and our period of record goes back to 1881. So in 2015, um, our June through Friday, last Friday, which I pulled these numbers, was our driest period on record for that time period. And this summer we are, had more rain, but we're still seventh driest. But most of that rain fell in one day in early June. So, and I'm playing with the numbers, I know, but you take that one day out and you look at the June 16th through current. And now 2017 is tied with 2015 for the driest. And the interesting thing to me, um, again, as a hydrologist for the water year is 2015 was a pretty dry winter if you looked at the water year precip. It was in the bottom 20%, uh, but 2017 is right now the second wettest water year. Even though we have one of our driest summers on record so far, we're still in second place for the wettest. So Nick showed you the stream flows. Um, that water is still working its way through the system. I got a call from somebody a couple weeks ago that's still dealing with groundwater flooding on their property. Um, and then for temperatures, another interesting one. So, so far this summer, 2015 ranks as the hottest. Um, 2017 is just a shade below that and is right now tied for second place, a three-way tie. And as Nick mentioned about the smoke, um, that was, this is the image from August 4th, satellite image. That was right in the midst of uh, that heat wave that was coming um, that really damped our temperatures down. So that average temp for 2017 would be higher right now if it weren't for the smoke that we've had this summer. And we're also not done. So I just thought that was pretty interesting that 2015 was a pretty extreme year and we have another one now in 2017, at least at that station. So that's about all I have, just continuation of increased odds of above average temperatures, um, low average precip in the near term, but no strong signal in the long term. And then looks like we could be heading into a neutral winter. And that's all I have for now. And if there's a question now, I'll take it. Otherwise, I'll wait to the end. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, I don't see any questions in the box uh, at this moment, uh, but certainly if any of the other panelists have questions, we, we have a little bit of time. Any others? Okay. Well, hearing none, um, uh, Gabriele, I think you're up next. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Thanks so much, John. Uh, just making sure my screen was showing all right. So, well, thanks, folks, for joining today. 
Um, I thought I would just give a little background. I think now the folks who have been joining this webinar are a little bit more aware of the Climate Hub. So I, I thought I'd just give you a little bit background about us, but we wanted to save plenty of time. We tend to bring in a guest speaker uh, to talk about relevant issues. We're gonna be talking about fire, which I think goes well with our previous presentation. Uh, but just a little more on the Climate Hub. So we were really created to provide information and tools so managers, farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners, and those who advise and work with them can reduce weather and climate related risks particularly by incorporating science-based climate change information in their decision-making. So on our website, um, that's the national website, and then you can dig into the regional website. You can find regional, regional climate um, and vulnerability assessments, educational materials, blogs, papers, and webinars, and plenty of tools and data visualizations. Uh, our website is under construction right now. It's gonna be pretty wonderful when it's finished, uh, but just be aware that things are moving around and changing. Uh, so it's maybe not the best time to check out our website, Site, but keep keep it on your radar. It's going to be great in another month or so. We'll see. Uh, these things always change the deadlines. But and then just to kind of note, we've contributed to the fourth national climate assessment. Uh, been participating in that process. We've also funded nearly 12 or a total of 12 projects for this upcoming fiscal year, and they're ranging from soil health to specialty crops, dryland farming, rangeland health, and climate impacts to yellow cedar. So a lot of exciting and really diverse kinds of effort. So I think that this has already been kind of covered. I just wanted to show folks another resource that I thought might be interesting. So this NC web, um, which I'm showing a page, a page of for the Chetco bar fire, which I got last week. So that's not updated as of today. Uh, but this website is an interagency all risk incident information management system. And it was really kind of developed with two missions to provide the public a single source of incident related information and then sort of a standardized reporting tool for public affairs. So I encourage folks, you can look, that's actually national, but there's a lot of activity in our region right now. So uh, lots of good up-to-date information. And then uh, I also thought I would point out on the website, there are a couple of blogs in Oregon and Washington to look at uh, smoke information and really to kind of get us thinking about human health impacts. And I think they're nice resources and ties in well with the presentations or uh, the slides earlier. So uh, for those who are kind of thinking and tracking those things, it's definitely been, there's been some major impacts uh, to our air quality in the region. And certainly there are folks who that impacts more than others. So finally, um, I would like to welcome Sarah Rolfs from the Era of Mega Fires Project, uh, which is a partnership between the US Forest Service and we've had a lot of great contributions from Dr. Paul Hesberg and Dr. Dave Peterson, who are Forest Service scientists, uh, and they've worked with North 40 Productions. Sarah, I'm sure, will tell you more about it. Um, she's a project coordinator and has been making a significant impact on regional and local issues throughout Central Washington for over a decade. Fueled by her passions for education and forest health, Sarah connects the era of mega fires with interested communities and makes sure they have everything they need to put on their own successful events. And she's also a forest landowner. And if you dig into the website here, um, she tells a little bit about her story as well. So I'm gonna pass it off to Sarah. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, I, full disclosure is I um, am not a scientist. That's Dr. Paul Hesberg from the Forest Service, but he's off playing hooky doing research in the Bob Marshall this month. So I'm kind of pinch hitting for him. Um, but the era of megafires, just a little bit of background is a, <clears throat> as mentioned um, it's a collaboration between the forest service and then a private nonprofit called the wildfire project and we've been collaborating on providing um, educational presentations to communities throughout the pacific northwest we've been um, in and actually we've gone up to bc this earlier in june and we've hit montana we're headed to utah this fall um, and actually, we just got confirmed that we're going to head out to D.C. and present at the W.O. for the Forest Service in conjunction with W.R.I. Um, the intent of it is to provide um, education on the issues surrounding wildfires and megafires in particular, climate change, of course, being one of them. Um, and as mentioned before, you know, smoke gets to be a big issue as far as regulation. You have a wildfire. There's no way to actually really regulate it. So then we don't get to do the prescribed burns, which is actually... Um, less harmful to us humans and, you know, across the board to animals as well um, because of the particulates that are burning. So um, I guess I'll show you, we have a chapter in our presentation that's called climate change. 
um, and it does interview Peterson and it gives a little bit of information from his research. Um, and then, you know, field any questions, um, but we'll go from there. So can you cue the video, please? So, of course, we know that when we have hotter and drier weather, we're going to get more fire. So that's not rocket science. But what we're seeing is a potentially permanent change in our weather patterns to drier summers, longer fire seasons, and just having fire become a more prominent player across the landscape. When I sit down at my desk and I actually look at the data, it kind of hits me in the face. There are some things changing very quickly. We have about a hundred years of fire history data in the Western United States. And it's very easy to develop a statistical relationship between climate and fire occurrence. When we project those relationships into the future, by about mid-century, we end up getting two to three times more fire per year in eastern Washington and in other areas around the Intermountain West where dry forests exist. That's a tremendous change ecologically and it's going to be a tremendous change also in terms of the impacts on human communities. So we're going to have a long adjustment as we go through this period of increased fire. And the main thing that we need to be aware of is a lot of our forests have not experienced fire for many decades. That means we have a lot of fuel buildup, and that means when fires do occur, they're going to be intense, they're going to be crown fires, and they'll probably cover a lot of area because it's very difficult to suppress those kinds of fires. At some point later in the 21st century, we may catch up with what I call the fire debt. But at least in the near term, we can probably expect to have a lot more of these high intensity, large fires. We need a shift in attitude from the concept of resisting fire to living with fire because it is part of our environment. Um, so some of those slides that you saw in there with the heavy smoke, that's from Wenatchee, which is our hometown. And um, there was the graph that I actually took a screenshot of earlier to show how awful that smoke really gets. We get the inversion much like you'll see in Missoula. Um, so the smoke just gets socked into our valley. Um, the one thing that I, and I know that Paul, Dr. Hesberg has been discovering with some of his colleagues is the, the wind is really starting to play a big role, partly because of these mega fires creating their own weather um, as we've experienced seeing um, with the getting all that uh, smoke down from BC and from the Diamond Creek fire and now Jolly Mountain. Um, I don't know if there's any specific questions about what we showed. I mean, the one thing that um, Hesburgh really tries to drive home is where the McMurray fire was is there, you know, we're north central Washington here in Wenatchee and Fort McMurray is halfway between us and the Arctic Circle and they had their largest fire start in May, which is pretty astounding when you think about how far north they are and what their temperature should be. So I guess that's about all I have if you, there aren't any questions. Great. Well, thanks, Sarah and, and Gabrielle. Uh, are there any questions out there right now for, uh, for Sarah or really any, any of the other panelists? Seeing none. Um, well, feel free to type those in. Sarah, uh, I did have a question. I mean, so what is your group doing in terms of, I mean, I guess, the, or is, is there a component uh, to this work? And what does that look like? I'm sorry, you cut out when the what kind of component? Oh, uh, an engagement, kind of an outreach engagement component. Yeah, so so we've been to over 70 cities throughout the Pacific Northwest and BC. 
Um, and so what we do is we go into a community um, and, and by and large, someone will contact me and because I'm the, the organizer and we go into the community and we provide, um, Dr. Hesburg does a presentation called the Aaron Megafires. It's just under an hour now. And then there's Q&A and we usually really encourage the, the hosting organization to invite local community experts so that they can talk about the, the, what, what the local issues um, specifically. And the idea, the goal that we have is to educate the general population so that they can participate in the conversation about fires. You know, it's becoming such a um, part of our life here in the Pacific Northwest in particular. Um, and so then in turn, we can talk to our policy makers. You know, our previous public lands commissioner up here in Washington, stated at a summit we had, he said, you know, I get calls about people complaining about prescribed burn fires. I've never heard anybody call and say, hey, thanks for doing that because it's going to prevent us from having a catastrophic wildfire. Um, and so as a politician trying to get reelected, you know, they listen to their constituents. And so we're trying to educate people on on what that looks like and that actually prescribed burn it's planned and yeah, some of them get away, but that's only about one or 2%. And would you rather know that you can't go hiking on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week because of a prescribed burn or would you rather get socked in for 30 days? Um, so the, yes, we're, we're doing outreach. We, ha we, um, we had a fall tour and we had a spring tour and we're kicking off our fall tour this September 8th in Roslyn, Washington. We do have some Oregon dates and some Idaho dates and actually out to Montana again. So uh, um, as mentioned before by Gabrielle, we have a website. Um, actually, we have a new one we kicked off. It's called the Arab Megafire. So if you just Google search Arab Megafires, you'll be able to see the tour schedule. Um, and then we're also, it looks like we're rolling into spring as well. Great, okay, great. Yeah, so very significant en engagement component. Um, well, you know, uh, certainly at CERC, we're happy to help share some of those dates. Gabrielle or, or Sarah, if you want to send us some of those, we're, we're happy to, um, to push them through and, and help make them available. Okay. Um, great. Well, were there uh, any other questions out there lingering, lingering on people's minds before we wrap up? We're certainly well ahead of schedule. Um, we have plenty of time um, scheduled for the remaining of the webinar. So It looks like there's uh, two types of talk. questions, John. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, I don't see those, so... Yeah, sorry, um, I can read them off then. Um, man, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the indicators of drought shown don't seem to explain what we are seeing along the Oregon coast, as indicated by the Chechco Bar Fire. However, the 30-day eddy assessment is pretty intriguing. Does the Northwest Dews look at eddy when assessing drought conditions? Hmm. Well, uh, Nick, do you want to take a stab at that one, or Catherine? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I could. Oh, go ahead, Nick. Uh, yeah, uh, Catherine, I was gonna uh, hope that you could address that one. Sure. Um, yeah, we we kind of look at a lot of different factors, and um, sometimes that one comes into play. You know, the drought categories for D zero, D one, etc., are pretty specific, and it's been really challenging over the last few years to figure out how fire factors into that because, you know, for instance, we had a really wet winter, so there's not a real hit on reservoirs in a lot of areas. Stream flows are great, but it's been so hot and dry, there's fire. So there's no easy answer. Yes, it's worked at, but it's not the only factor, and it, you can't just make a drought designation based on one, one specific parameter. I hope that answers the question. For those of you that don't know, Eddie is the Evaporative Demand Drought Index. It's one of probably 50 to 60 different indices now that go into the U.S. Drought Monitor categories. Um, okay, the next question is, what are the smoke impacts in Southwest Oregon? They seem to be surrounded by fires and reports I'm getting from Medford, Medford indicate it's pretty bad down there and has been for a while. He wants to take a stab at that one. Can you repeat the question again? Sorry. Uh, what are the smoke impacts in Southwest Oregon? 
They seem to be surrounded by fires, and reports I'm getting from Medford indicate it's pretty bad down there and has been for a while. So smoke impacts on Southwest Oregon? Yeah, I can't yes. see that. I don't know if anyone else. Yeah, this is John. Unfortunately, uh, this would be great to have Kathy in here because she's um, so well connected to a lot of the um, other offices throughout the state. Um, you know, I I think that's true. If you look at the Medford area, it's not just the Chetco Bar fire burning to its west, but it's also a number of smaller fires uh, burning um, to the east and the Cascades as well. So they, I mean, they really are uh, fairly encircled there. NASA has some great imagery. That I've been using on a personal note when I'm trying to you know, plan some trips. Um, I really encourage people to go check that out as well. Uh, if, you, if you think if you Google NASA uh, uh, fire and smoke, um, you should come up with some, some of the satellite imagery they have of smoke and it's um, fairly real time. Um, so I would encourage you to, to check that out as well. And, it, and as you know, I mean, the, the smoke impacts are highly dependent on the, the existing winds at the moment. Um, so you know, one day it can be quite bad, and of course, if things shift, um, they can blow that out uh, into some, somebody else as well. And the website um, that I had, oh, sorry, I was just going to jump no, in to say the website that um, the Oregon Smoke dot Blogspot dot com. Um, that's the website that I shared, and they have actually Medford an unhealthy circle over it right now, and I know that that's been holding pretty steady um, much of uh, at least the fire season in Oregon. But you actually look. Uh, air quality in most of sort of south southern Oregon is not great, especially um, west of the Cascades. So if you go to that website, it's nice. It it goes all the way through from good, moderate, unhealthy for certain groups, and then um, unhealthy for everyone, very unhealthy, and then hazardous. And they update this regularly. So uh, there's a few spots that are hazardous right now in some parts of I think uh, near closer to some of the fires. That are going on. So, anyways, that's a good website, and Washington has one as well. I wasn't able to find one for Oregon or, sorry, um, Idaho, but um, I might. I didn't look super hard, but I think these are really helpful for those planning, you know, personal or just uh, keeping track of what's going on. So that's Oregon Smoke dot Blogspot dot com, and then there's a Wasmoke dot Blogspot dot com as well. So, and there's a lot of details on the website. Um, uh, one thing uh, I should add is that in terms of the actual health impacts and how many you know, emergency room visits and that sort of thing, that sort of data is usually um, not available in real time. And so we, um, as far as I know, I don't know where uh, if it's even possible to get the statistics on, you know, uh, what the human health impacts have been so far. Far, but I'd have to expect that they've um, there have been some significant issues for some folks, especially with uh, chronic um, you know, pulmonary problems and so forth. I know the Department of Health, um, Oregon Department of Health, is really fantastic. They actually um, are really they have a whole um, group who's looking at climate impacts, but also obviously are thinking about things like smoke and um, and other weather impacts or associated weather impacts uh, to human health, and so. I won't try to pull it up here, but I know if you go to um, Oregon Public Health or the Oregon Health Authority, uh, you might even, you know, for folks on the line, might call somebody there to get those statistics. I don't know how, yeah, how regularly, but they do track those kinds of things. And I believe Washington uh, State, um, their health department does the same. So those are two resources. Again, I don't know how often those are published, but I think they do need to make them available in public if people ask for them. Uh, and there's been a big, uh, because of, uh, some of the work with the National Climate Assessment, there's been greater attention paid to what are going to be the health effects if we continue to have these kinds of um, smoke and fire prevalence moving forward in the future. So uh, I know there's increased interest to do more research on those things and making linkages, but yeah, State Department of Health is a, is a good place to start at least for those interested. Great, uh, thanks Nick and Gabriel. Um, Let's see, are, Amanda, are there any other questions there? Uh, um, that... There's a quick, I think this might be a follow-on comment to what you guys were just talking about. Someone wrote, um, in Oregon, we can get emergency department visits in 24-hour increments. Best, best contact is Mer Meredith Jagger at the Oregon Health Authority. I think that was a response Great. to the discussion. So. Um, otherwise, I think that's it. 
Okay. Um, well, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, not only for great information, but also presenting it in a, a timely fashion. Um, and I think if you have uh, other specific questions you can certainly email me uh, Amanda perhaps you would also be willing to uh, receive uh, emails for follow-up questions for any of the panelists you can pass pass along yeah. um, great and with that I'll, I'll hand it back to you to, to wrap us up and talk about uh, what our next uh, webinar is going to take place yeah, thanks, John. And thank you also to all the speakers. Um, we won't be able to do these sort of things without the regional experts in the region. And so it's great to have everyone presenting and take turns and um, give out their information of their groups and organizations and research projects. Um, the next webinar is scheduled for October 23rd at 11 a.m. You can already go to register either at the link there or visit drought.gov. Um, all the recording and webinar slides and other materials from today will be uploaded to drought.gov in the next few days. So if you want to check back or share this with others, you can go ahead and see there. Um, and if there are, as John said, if there's any more questions, feel free to contact us. Otherwise, we'll hear from you next time. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, all.